Well, thank you very much for joining us for another edition of Salmon Matter. This is a co-production of the Pacific Salmon Foundation and Conversations That Matter. We are continuing to do our Salmon Matter conversations virtually with our guests because we are in the coronavirus uh, situation. We're continuing to be adaptive, just like the salmon have to be. Uh, today, our guest is one of my colleagues at the Pacific Salmon Foundation, Ben Skinner. Uh, and Ben is a GIS specialist. That stands for Geographic Information Systems. He works with our Strait of Georgia Data Center, uh, which is part of our science and research program at the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for having me on the show. You bet. Looking forward to talking to you more about the Strait of Georgia Data Center, what that's all about. But first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your passion for the environment, uh, education background, that type of thing. Sure. So I guess you could trace it back all the way to my childhood. Uh, I was born into a very outdoors-oriented family uh, that took me to all sorts of beautiful places, such as the tide pools that uh, are all around the Strait of Georgia, to mountaintops, to streams that had salmon swimming in them. And uh, it really instilled a passion for the outdoors and uh, ultimately compelled me to study geography at the University of Victoria. And I then went on to study geographic information systems or GIS at the British Columbia Institute for Technology. I'd like to define GIS uh, when I mention what it is because a lot of people aren't really too sure what GIS is. Uh, so GIS is uh, the study of basically cartography in the modern times. So on computers, uh, it's also the management of the data that goes into maps, virtual maps on your computer, uh, as well as um, putting that into databases. And we call that geospatial data. I love that explaining it. It's the new new type of cartographer. It makes so much sense when you say it like that. And you know, you're able to do so much now with maps digitally. You can show things happening over time. You can show many different layers of, of, of information. And I think we almost as viewers or consumers of this uh, digital material, we kind of take that for granted. But uh, tell me what it's like to be on the other end, the people that are building the maps and having all these tools at your disposal. It must be very cool. It is very cool. It's uh, a constant learning game. The field of geographic information systems was started in the 90s, but it's still developing so much. And a lot of it is online now. So a lot of my work uh, revolves around putting maps into the public eye through our website. And that's a very new field uh, in a lot of regards. So it's definitely fun to be on the cutting edge of that technology. OK, well, that's a good segue, too, into the Strait of Georgia Data Center. Uh, it's actually not a gigantic building with a lot of people working in it, is it? It's it's uh, probably uh, describe it for us so people can understand what we mean when we talk about a data center. Sure. So first, the techie stuff to get that out of the way. Uh, so the data center is housed at the University of British Columbia. They're our partner. Uh, the PSF and the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at UBC run the data center. Uh, so we have a couple servers at UBC, and those allow us to do uh, the data portal um, to keep it running, as well as to put the maps online. Uh, so when you go to the website, you don't see the servers in the background, though. What you see is a data portal, which has over 600 records at this point on a lot of marine information um, from anything to do with economy to ecology to the oceanography of the Strait of Georgia. And Ben, take us back a little bit. Tell us a little bit of the origin story about the data center. What's the gap that it's filling in terms of, of research and, and knowledge? And I guess, you know, why did, why did we or why do we need a, a data center for the Strait of Georgia? Thanks for asking, Mike. So uh, the Strait of Georgia Data Center was started in 2012 by my colleague, Isabel Pierzel. She was the one really pushing for it. She pitched the idea to the board of directors at the PSF and uh, they went ahead. What she proposed was a one-stop shop for marine information. There was a lot of information out there and a lot of it wasn't 
accessible publicly or it was a little hard to get to. So she proposed that they would have one website where you could go search through any website uh, to do with marine information all in one spot so you're not browsing around spending too much time looking for it. So what the data center is, is where you can save time in data acquisition essentially. Uh, we have a few goals that also relate to that. Centralization is the streamlining of data acquisition. However, as I mentioned, it's open access. So open access means that we believe people have the right to information. So all the data is public. And we also spend some time doing data rescue and data sharing, which is essentially finding data that's sitting on shelves or that's maybe private and that we should think should be public. Um, we then pull that into the data portal so that researchers uh, the general public, policymakers can all have access to that information, which ultimately leads to better science and better decision making when it comes to environmental policy. Okay. Yeah, I know one of these things I read about and have heard about in our work is this notion of the brain drain that we have a large uh, population of scientists and researchers who are in the baby boomer generation that are preparing to retire, whether it's from universities or government uh, laboratories. Is that part of your mandate as well as, as to basically give a home to, to the research and data that may have been going on for you know decades and now someone's retiring? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of data was, as you mentioned, mentioned through reports, uh, through research, but it wasn't available in a public spot. So that was definitely part of the creation of the Strait of Georgia Data Center was to give that historical data a spot where it could be easily found. Uh, additionally, there was a lot of research coming out of the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, which is a project between the Pacific Salmon Foundation in Canada and Long Live the Salmon Kings in the United States. It's essentially looking into why survival of salmon in the Salish Sea has declined uh, so high compared to areas of the Northwest, say like the Columbia River. This research didn't have anywhere to end up. So the portal was created so that it could be easily discovered. Yeah, and you know, help us understand people that are you know, in the salmon world but maybe not necessarily experts uh, or scientists. Uh, how, what do you think will be the uh, the sort of game changing factor or the so what factor for salmon relative to the Strait of Georgia data center? I think that having work that can be built on is going to be ultimately what's going to affect how salmon can be protected better through the policy that's put in place by having work more readily available researchers can collaborate better and having that research coming out uh, at a quicker rate or at a more accurate rate, I think can ultimately affect the decisions that go into protecting salmon. Great. Well, Ben, give us uh, a couple of examples of some of the creative, visual, interesting stuff that you're uh, working on right now. Sure. Uh, so I'll go back to one of the projects that we worked on uh, as part of the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. There was a citizen science oceanography program that uh, was ultimately powered by volunteers. Uh, it was run through the PSF, though volunteers were going out on their boats multiple times a month for years. The program is actually still running. It's been going for five years now, and they were collecting oceanographic data so that's temperature data, salinity data, uh, plankton data, which is microscopic plants, nutrient data. And they were then giving this to researchers who could answer questions like, are there presence of harmful algae in certain spots of the Strait of Georgia? Harmful algae uh, is important to study because it can kill salmon or cause shellfish poisoning. Uh, it also studied things like how is climate change impacting the waters of the Strait of Georgia? as well as it can answer questions as to where is the best places to restore eelgrass or kelp habitat that salmon rely on in the Strait of Georgia. So we had all of this data coming out of the citizen science program that was in numbers that is very interesting to scientists, though they can only look at numbers so much. 
So <laughs> what I was brought on to do was create some more colorful and easier to understand visuals that uh, would help researchers as well as policymakers and the general public understand what was going on in this program. So I started off by doing some simple animations of showing how the locations of where the sampling occurred changed over the program to better increase the effort. I then created some visualizations of data that had been analyzed. So I collaborated with some of the scientists at the Pacific Salmon Foundation who were doing phytoplankton research into where humphral algae blooms occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, I also collaborated with some, some scientists looking into where max temperatures were uh, occurring in the Strait of Georgia. These two factors, uh, max temperatures and harmful algae blooms, can stress out uh, nearshore habitats, so eelgrass and kelp, as well as salmon. So by knowing where these occur and having visualizations which can clearly show where they occur, allow us to better restore habitat for salmon is one example of how that research can positively impact uh, salmon survival. We then went on to create some interactive maps of this data. So again, an easy way to visualize things such as phytoplankton levels. So you can see uh, on some of the maps on our website that there is harmful algae blooms or algae blooms occurring in certain parts of the strait. Uh, very interesting to researchers, though I definitely find it interesting as well <laughs> as uh, yeah. a GIS specialist and just as a, a, a resident of the Vancouver area. And then we do things such as story maps to raise awareness about the projects that are going on. So what a story map is, is it's a mixed multimedia platform that includes uh, text, video, interactive maps, all to kind of portray information in a slideshow style. Uh, we had one of these for the citizen science program. We had one for juvenile salmon and how they relate to kelp and eelgrass. So these raise awareness as well as uh, show some of the visuals that I've been working on, giving more information to researchers that are out there as to the kind of work that's already been going on. Once they're more aware of the work that's already going on, they can then build off of that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That's really, it's exciting stuff. I know the citizen science fleet, which you noted has been out there for several years. These are uh, just regular folks that live in coastal communities and have uh, offered to be uh, helpful in collecting this information. And I know there, and there's a lot of citizen scientists uh, working in BC. They're always interested to see, well, how does it actually help make a difference? And uh, so you were saying that this information is actually helping the researchers then advance their own uh, research projects. Right. So it's also helping advance things like restoration. Uh, there's organizations out there that are planting eelgrass to try and combat the decline of eelgrass throughout the Strait of Georgia due to climate change, human impact. So by having information as to where the best waters are to plant eelgrass, they can help increase the survival of this eelgrass going into parts of the strait. So these tools you have at your disposal, they're already very cool. Where do you see things going uh, in your field in the next five, 10 years? What are the, the big things we can expect from the State of Georgia Data Center down the road? You can definitely expect uh, larger maps, <laughs> uh, more interactive maps, uh, as well as uh, we're going to be launching um, a spatial data download portal that uh, will bring in data from uh, all sorts of different sources and different organizations and allow you to filter that data so that uh, you can take a data set that's 10 million records and bring it down to 200 records. Uh, so from a very large file size to a very small file size, which is important if uh, you don't want to crash your computer. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we're going to be working on some maps that are related to uh, marine spatial planning by having uh, the technology nowadays to create maps with so much power behind them, you can bring so many layers into them. And uh, by having all of these layers in one map, it allows people to compare the components of the environment and the economy in the strait and uh, again can guide decision makers in what they're doing 
for example, in the creation of a marine protected area. Yeah, and that's big, been a big advancement we've had in Canada in the last few years is more marine protected areas and proposed protected areas. It's interesting what you were saying of layering the environmental uh, and the economic. Tell us a bit more about what you're doing in particular on the marine spatial planning front. Sure. So right now there's still the need to kind of organize the data that's out there a little bit. Uh, for example, one thing we're working on right now is collaborating uh, different eelgrass data sets into uh, one layer as opposed to multiple layers. So multiple organizations have looked at eelgrass, sometimes in different areas, sometimes in the same area. Now we want to put them all into one spot, one data set where it can accurately show where eelgrass is. And you can say these areas were surveyed, these areas were not surveyed. So that simplifies things and will allow us to make our end marine spatial planning maps a little bit more organized and easy to use. Yeah, and you've mentioned eelgrass a couple of times. I often refer to this as the underwater rainforest. It, it's that habitat that we may not see as much, but it protects those little juvenile salmon. It provides food for them. Uh, and uh, that habitat's been lost uh, quite a bit in the Strait of Georgia, hasn't it, over the last several decades? That's right. So some of the research that was going on as part of the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project looked at the decline of eelgrass. Uh, quite a few projects looked at this. And uh, unfortunately, things like development, um, increased anchoring of boats, as well as climate change are all impacting eelgrass, which uh, is plays such a vital role, as you mentioned, in juvenile salmon survival. So Keeping eelgrass uh, and kelp, which also plays a similar role, healthy is going to be integral to the Strait of Georgia. Yeah, and you were saying uh, the mapping leads then to restoration. We've had uh, uh, one group in particular that's been out there actually developing what they call uh, thermal tolerant uh, a kelp. Uh, in other words, potentially uh, tolerant to changes in temperature. Uh, it's remarkable the advancements that are happening and a lot of it does happen because you need to know on maps where where was the habitat uh, and, and where are the restoration opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's really cool stuff. Uh, definitely really admire the work that's going on out there. Well, Ben, I want to thank you very much. This has been fascinating to learn more about what it is to be a GIS specialist. Maybe I'll ask you in, in closing, you know, what do you say to young people uh, to encourage them to think about this as a, as a career opportunity? I would say patience. Uh, it can always be a little bit uh, challenging when you first get into a technological field. However, if you're willing to jump over the initial hurdles and uh, can get it back into uh, stride so that you're doing work that you feel is valuable and you're efficient at it, it's really fun stuff. And uh, there's some great programs out there that you can partake in. And GIS is a growing field, so I see more and more need for it in the future. Well, Ben Skinner, thank you for all your work with PSF, the Strait of Georgia Data Center. Uh, thanks for being a part of this conversation today. And we should also thank the major donors to Pacific Salmon Foundation, Government of, Government of Canada, Government of British Columbia are both major supporters, and many, many other foundations, individuals, and companies uh, in BC. And the Sitka Foundation, of course, has been a longtime major supporter of the development of the Strait of Georgia Data Center, so we have to give them a special uh, thanks as well. Anything you'd like to add before we close out, Ben? I think you've said it all, Mike. I would just give my personal thanks as well to everyone you've thanked and uh, do the cliche, thank my parents for uh, <laughs> getting me involved in this field. <laughs> Well, I'm glad they took you out of those title pools, Ben. And uh, I, I think everyone echoes, thank mom and dad. Okay, Ben Skinner, GIS specialist with the Strait of Georgia Data Center at PSF. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Sam and Matter. We'll have more of these coming your way. Uh, and for now, stay well. Stay well.